In this experiment, we are going to determine the half-life of metastable barium-137 isotope using the SPECTEC isotope generator. Here we have uh, some information from the kit that comes with the SPECTEC isotope generator. You can see that uh, the material for uh, delivering the isotope is here and the eluding solution is here. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. So uh, what comes in this little cartridge here is some cesium-137. It's about 10 microcuries of it. And cesium-137 has a 30.1 year half-life and it has the ability to decay directly to barium-137, which is stable, but only about 5.4% of it takes that route with a high energy uh, beta particle release. The other 95% of it uh, decays with a beta particle that is slightly lower in energy and then has to release the additional energy through a gamma ray being emitted. Um, there is a short delay in the decay process that releases the gamma ray. And so that short-lived particle is metastable barium-137. So our objective here is to determine for ourselves what the half-life of that decay process is. In the diagram here, it says 2.6 minutes the uh, more accurate value is 2.55 minutes. So we're going to see uh, with our equipment in the ISO generator here, how well we can determine that value. So with this system, we can, with the syringe that comes in the kit and the eluding solution, which is made up of 0.9% sodium chloride and 0.04 molar hydrochloric acid, selectively leave the cesium in the cartridge and push just the barium through and onto a little aluminum plate, which we will put into a Geiger counter to measure the amount of radioactivity that we can detect from the metastable barium-137 giving off those gamma rays. So here we have the ISO generator that has the cesium inside that is constantly decaying to our metastable barium-137. It has a cap on either end that I'm going to remove. And here I have a syringe full of the eluding solution. The ISO generator has a arrow on it that tells me which direction I should push the solution through. And I am going to add a few drops onto a little aluminum tray. First time this particular one is being used. All right, so there we have it. I'm going to replace the uh, caps. And then place the dish inside my Geiger counter. I'm going to turn on the Geiger counter and reset to start taking counts. And as you can hear, the activity is fairly high. So at the end of the first minute of counting, you might be attempted to, uh, rather tempted, to record this versus uh, a table including a value of one minute, then the next one at two minutes, and then three minutes, and four minutes, etc. 
However, when the first reading shows up on our Geiger counter, we should enter that versus time equals zero because this will be our initial reading, our time equals zero that we're going to compare everything else to as time goes on, right? So even though you would naturally think that this would be time equals one, this reading of 25.22 is gonna be our t equals zero reading. So if we were going to estimate the half-life without doing any fancy calculations uh, using our computers and graphing, which is what we're going to do eventually, uh, and we just wanted to use our raw data, we would say that a half-life is the amount of time for the reading to decrease to one half its original value. So we wanna know how long does it take to decrease to half of this value. So when does it decrease to half of 25.22? So after one minute, it decreases to 19.32. So we're definitely not down to half of 25.22 yet. Half of 2522 is a little over minutes we have 1460. We're still not down to half of what we started with. what we get after three minutes. We have 11.48, so that's less than half. So that's telling us just based on our raw data that we should end up somewhere between two and three minutes. So that agrees with what the literature said, that it was at 2.55 minutes. So we're going to get a bit better estimate of that using a graphing technique, which we'll talk about after we're finished collecting all of the data. So in order to get a good trend line, we're going to need a couple more pieces of data. So we're going to collect it at four minutes and five minutes as well. So let's go ahead and collect two more pieces of data. Eight sixty five. 
And I just reread the directions for this experiment. It said to go out to 10 minutes, so we're going to go a little bit further. Four at five minutes. There's definitely um, some uncertainty in these numbers because radiation uh, is a sort of sporadic event so that uh, some of these, uh, if you repeated this experiment, uh, some of these numbers would be lower, others would be higher. So we need to have multiple values in order to get a reliable trend line for our analysis. I have 20 at six. Or 31 at 7. And I think we'll take it to 8 minutes, which will get us at least three half lives out. And that should be good enough to get us enough data to graph for this uh, video experiment. Three hundred and twenty seven. All right. In order to get a more accurate uh, calculation of the half life, you'll need to make an Excel graph or some other uh, electronic graph if you don't have Excel. Uh, you'll need to start by, uh, from each of the counts per minute that we just determined, you'll need to subtract the background. Uh, we determined background in a previous video. If you haven't uh, done that yet, go ahead and watch that to determine what the background is. So that you'll then get uh, the different times versus the background corrected readings. And then you'll need to take the natural log of each of those background corrected readings. And those will be the values that you would plot on the y-axis. And then the time, again, starting at zero on the x-axis. If you graph that, you should get some points that are not on a perfect line like is shown here, but that should have a correlation. Uh, in Excel, if you right click on any of those points, it'll allow you the option to add a trend line and to put the equation of that trend line on the graph. 
from the equation of that trend line, the m value, the slope, is equal to minus the rate constant k, since all radioactive decay processes are first order. You can get the half-life of that decay process uh, from the fact that uh, the half-life is equal to the natural log of 2, which is 0 0.6. Uh, 3, 9 over the, k, the rate constant k. So that's a way that you can uh, go about getting the half-life from your graph.